Hi everyone, this is Nikhil Torskar, uh, coming to you from Chicago with uh, The Shelley Story. Uh, as you know, uh, my wife Shelley and I, we have written a book and we have been doing podcasts and blog posts and all kinds of content um, related to our journeys uh, as South Asian uh, first generation immigrants, talking about our journeys with, uh, with mental health, with careers, uh, with parenting, with physical health. And one of the things that has come across as being very worthy of discussing further is different approaches uh, to managing one's health uh, beyond just the tried and true uh, tactics of like medication and surgery. And one of those topics is uh, Ayurveda and yoga. Um, it's something that uh, as an Indian, I have had exposure to as a child, but it's really been fascinating to me uh, just in terms of filling in those gaps uh, that a lot of people face, you know, in terms of managing their different conditions and just living a healthier, happier life. And so I was very excited to cross paths with today's guest, uh, Neelam Singh, uh, who is a practitioner of uh, Ayurveda and yoga. And so I was very excited that she was able to uh, offer some of her time to discuss her journey, talk about her experience with, uh, with Ayurveda and yeah, we're really just uh, very excited to uh, to speak to her today. So, uh, so Neilan, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, and I love I love this platform. I love the concept of it. Um, so I'm very excited to be here today. Yeah, absolutely. Very glad to have you. Uh, so Neilan has been an intentional and conscious eater um, for most of her life, starting with uh, turning vegetarian in 2003. Uh, as her journey continued, she's acquired more understanding of cooking medicinally with intention and purpose uh, and Ayurvedically to restore balance, heal and detoxify. This has also empowered her to address uh, health issues first with food, teas, herbs, rest and meditation and breathing rather than immediately turning to allopathic medicine, which may alleviate the symptoms but mask the root of the issue. After turning to Ayurveda for healing after facing health complications in 2012, she realized that it was part of her journey to share the ancient wisdom of Ayurveda and yoga because the power to heal, recenter, restore balance, detoxify, expand or elevate your consciousness is too beautiful not to share. She decided to formalize her Ayurvedic knowledge by becoming a certified Ayurvedic health counselor in 2015. She has a practice in New York City where she works with clients in addressing their mind, body, constitution, makeup, identifying any imbalances and working with them to restore balance through diet, herbs, meditation, yoga, pranayama and other lifestyle changes. She hosts a variety of workshops that share principles of pranayama and Ayurveda and how they can benefit and enhance their life. Uh, she also runs an Ayurvedic cooking immersion retreats uh, in Costa Rica. Uh, which is where I'm sure we'd both uh, rather be right now. Um, so, so Neelam, yeah, again, very excited to have you here. And uh, if you want to maybe add a little bit to uh, what I had just talked about and just uh, if you could share a little bit more about your background and your story. Sure. Um, so I, I am a first generation Indian, all right? And my parents are Punjabi. They met in America and they came in their 30s. And raising my sister and I, right, they often mm -hmm. leveraged off what we, what I would know call now Ayurveda, but at the time mm -hmm. they never used the term Ayurveda, right? Sure. So you have a stomach mm -hmm. ache, they give you kitchari, right? You you have mm -hmm. a tummy ache and they rub asafoetida or hing on your belly, right? For yep. toothaches, yep. my dad would make me have a clove, right? Mm -hmm. and How about so, turmeric? Was that was that a big part of it also? Turmeric. Healthy? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> However, what's interesting to kill is my mom, she's been using Haldi forever, right? Mm -hmm. And three weeks ago, she calls me up and she says, okay, every time I use turmeric, am I supposed to use black pepper? Right? Because now the research is showing, right? Mm. That there's a compound in black pepper that activates the curcumin in turmeric. So when you, oh, wow. when you use them together, right? So it's almost like she was used to using Haldi in Indian food right? Just without mm -hmm. the black pepper. And now yeah. based kind of on this Western research, right? That's catching up on the benefits of healthy for your joints and your body. She's now incorporating black pepper in that, wow. right? Okay. So I like to say what we do is kind of a combination of Ayurveda plus, you know, we are very blessed with modern science and knowledge, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. so my family always incorporated Indian practices that their parents shared with them, 
but my parents are very in the know with scientific research as well. So they would kind of use a combination of that. Like most people who are listening, they may not have an in-depth knowledge of Ayurveda, but perhaps they heard of the doshas, right? Vata, mm -hmm. Pitta, Kapha. My yep. parents never used that language with me as a child, right? Mm -hmm. They never okay. said, oh, your Vata is very aggravated today, so I'm going right. to do this, right? So I think it's important to make that distinction because um, it's not like I grew up in an environment that was Ayurvedic language based, right? It yeah. was always my parents using these practices that their parents did to them that they knew mm -hmm. worked or some sort of intuitive wisdom where they knew they worked, right? So in that respect, I was raised in a sort of Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic way without realizing it was Ayurvedic. Right. So mm -hmm. then I go through life and I'm pretty mainstream, right? I go to college. I decide, you know, my father gave me a choice that I think a lot of Indian parents give their children. What do you want to be? Engineer, doctor, mm -hmm. lawyer, business. Yeah, right. Right. Broad, broad menu of options. <laughs> Four. <laughs> Four. Yeah, right. So I picked law, right? So mm -hmm. in my, in my teens and in my twenties, I was a traditional corporate lawyer where I worked for a law firm. Right. I was a little different because that's a vegetarian at the time. And I remember mm -hmm. I, was, I became a vegetarian at 22. And I remember really sticking out in the firm culture that I was a mm, vegetarian. Sure. Right. Sure. So from that perspective, you know, I'm kind of living my life through my 20s. And then later in my 20s is when I went through a very difficult external circumstance. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I was coming mm -hmm. out of a long term relationship. Um, I had all these visions and dreams and, you know, I realized that's not how my life is panning out. And what I am starting to know, realize now with New York City is we don't do well because that's where I'm from. We don't do well when we have free time on our hands. There's an anxiety that sits with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, it's not their fault. They're immersed in a culture, New York City, that's all about doing. Right. Sure. So a lot of people yep, yep. have anxiety when they have time on their hands and they take a pause. In my 20s, I took lots of pauses in life and I started to realize that I was very anxious, I was very mm -hmm. fearful, I was very worried. It was very difficult for me to sit and pause with my own mind. I didn't like my mind. I didn't like where my mind was taking me. Right. right. So out of desperation, I started to I'm a Sikh, so out of desperation, mm -hmm. I used to do lots of Simran, which is mm -hmm. um, sitting there, lotus position, and just chanting our God's name, like Wai Guru, Wai Guru, Wai Guru, Wai Guru, right? And I what is that? Could you could you repeat that um, concept again? What is it yeah. called? So we call it Simran, um, and basically our God, our energy, we we refer to this energy as Wai Guru, right? Oh, and okay. so. Okay. Um, the the kind of focus is if you focus on Waiguru's name, you always have mm. Waiguru in your heart and your mind, you will achieve peace, right? Mm. So anytime okay. a speak is in a hard situation, a lot of times they may not externally, but internally, they're doing what we call Simran, which is Waiguru, 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 Waiguru. Okay. And that word, because we have a connection to that word, brings a lot of us peace. Right. So it's so like I, saying Om Shanti, kind of that type of exactly. meditation. Then? Okay. Exactly. Right. Sure. So I started to, because I had this connection with food, I started to also analyze my diet. Right. And I exactly. started to look into how foods could affect me because on some level I knew when the mornings that I, I went a little bit longer in eating breakfast, I noticed I had more anxiety. Right. So I mm. started to make these internal connections. Then I start going on Google and researching, and I notice of all the systems out there, Ayurveda has a very strong philosophy about eating for your mind, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So then I mm -hmm. changed my diet a little bit. And I remember at the same time that this is happening, I would go for very long walks at the park in Brooklyn, Prospect Park. Mm -hmm. And at the time I would notice a Indian woman, an older Indian woman sitting there with a younger Indian woman, and they're always in lotus position, Gyan Mudra, mm. always mm -hmm. meditating. 
and mm -hmm. I wanted to approach them, but how do you approach someone in meditation stance? So I right. never approached Especially them. in New York City. <laughs> Not yeah, the most park, mind you, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remember observing them for about three weeks. And one day the younger woman comes up to me and she says, Santoshi, the older woman, mm -hmm. wants you to come sit with her tomorrow. Hmm. Now, okay. any other person said that, I would say, heck no. This yeah, is Yeah, right. Your Turn tail and run. Right? Get, like, out your pep get out your pepper spray. <laughs> right? But something, maybe curiosity. So I show up the next morning and I mm -hmm. sit with her. And okay. at this point, she's pretty fluent in Hindi. And mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest, I understand Hindi, but I don't speak Hindi. Right? Our yeah, language is same, Punjabi. Same. <laughs> so um, she just starts speaking to me in Hindi for about five mm -hmm. minutes. And okay. basically just tells me to sit there and breathe with her, right? Hmm. So for six months, every day we met in the park and I would breathe with her. And the most amazing thing is just looking at energetically how everything happened, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. first I'm like at the bottom low, that's where my mind's at. I'm feeling very low. I start sure. doing the Simran, right? So I'm getting a different type of energy around me. I start focusing on my food right so i'm trying to calm my mind that way i then mm -hmm. manifest an energy that i don't realize i'm manifesting in the external world and then my guru g finds me wow right that's amazing <laughs> and it's almost like she knew i needed pranayam she knew i needed yeah. work she knew like i needed something from her and she was so generous in sharing with me mm -hmm. um, that today like years later I still do the practice she originally gave me. And they always say that. I mean, you know, I'm sh I don't know if you've read, you know, like autobiography of a yogi or I don't oh know. Oh my God. Read, yeah. Yeah. Right? I have a funny story to tell you about that, but yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, they always say, right. That it's not you finding your guru. It's your guru finding you. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so all of this happened in like a year period from when I was feeling very low. And I'm not saying it was instantaneous where I started to feel better is a very slow kind of movement. Yeah. But I started to recognize the pranayam works, the eating works. And within maybe eight months from when I started, I started to notice dramatic shifts in my mind. And that's when I'm like, there is something to this. I was, I'm in a corporate attorney. I can support myself in New York. I do not need to go to school. But at that point, it became very clear that this um, one, because I'm Indian, I felt like I felt like I needed to embrace this. Yeah, and for sure. Felt, it's right? a gift. You you don't want to squander. I feel the same way. Yeah, for sure. Right. And I think we talked about this before, but it's in our cells, mm -hmm. right? It's in our yeah, samsara, it's in our DNA, right? But why aren't we returning to these things that mm -hmm. are connected to our ancestry, right? Uh, right. Why are we looking for something else? Because there's so much beauty and knowledge in the mm -hmm. Vedas, right? And the, yeah. I'm saying this as a Sikh. There's so right. much beauty and knowledge, right? And it's important collectively to nurture that and share it. Oh, no, that, that's a, that's an amazing journey. I mean, it's uh, I, um, it's just amazing about, you know, this convergence between sort of when you're thinking about certain things and then somehow the universe sort of presents somebody in your path or some concept. You ever had the experience where you're thinking of someone and they call you? No, oh, yeah, right? <laughs> absolutely. All the time. Right? And I'm not trying to be hokey dokey with that. It could just very well be a coincidence. But at the time I needed this practice and it came to me in this person. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Maybe if you can give a little bit of a walkthrough about um, Ayurveda, just so that people can, we can sort of anchor the discussion. Yeah. So I will back up a bit. Um, so Ayurveda composes a, is comprised of two words, are you and Veda, right? And the translation mm -hmm. is the knowledge or wisdom of life, right? Mm -hmm. And this is just so point on. Um, so Ayurveda believes in the concept of macro and microcosm. So essentially, the elements that make up the universe also make up ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And the elements that they're talking about are usually, are five elements. It's ether, which you can, 
think of ether as a space mm -hmm. that's empty. That's how you think of ether for purposes right. of this discussion. And then there's air, and then there's fire, and then there's water, and then there's earth, right? Mm -hmm. So these five elements of ether, air, fire, water, and earth manifest in everything in the universe, but it also manifests in humans, mm -hmm. right? We're all comprised of these five elements, but what makes us unique? What makes me unique from you or me unique from my mom mm -hmm. is the proportion of these elements that we come into this world with, right? right? And the elements. These five elements, they divide in what's called these biological constitutions, otherwise known as doshas, mm -hmm. right? There's three doshas. There's vata, pitta, and kapha, right? So vata is the elements of ether. Remember that space plus mm -hmm. air. That's vata, right? Pitta is fire, mostly fire, and then some water. Kapha is more water and then earth. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you look at Vata Pitta Kapha on this scale, you may notice that Vata, which is ether and air, is kind of this very subtle, intangible type of thing where when you yeah. start to get to Kapha, which is earth and water, it's it's more tangible. Right. I think of like when I think of Vata, uh, I always think of the term ethereal. And that just seems to be spot on because it's ether based, right? So it's very transitory, very sort of on the go, right? Yeah, you kind of nailed it on the head, right? Because I, I think of Vata as wind, right? Whenever, mm -hmm. when, because the thing is, Ayurveda's a beautiful thing. They gave us basically 20 qualities or 10 opposing pairs, um, mm -hmm. but 20 qualities to help us identify the characteristics of Vata, Pitta, Kapha, right? So you and I, we both have Vata, Pitta, Kapha in our bodies. But mm -hmm. I came into this world with more vata in my body and more pitta in my mind, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about um, what does that mean? What does it mean to have a vata body and a vata mind? What does that even mean, right? We can now leverage on these gunas or properties that Ayurveda has provided us, right? Yeah. So, And some of these properties are, okay, hot or cold. So if you think of wind, usually it's cold. Right. right. Um, is it heavy or light? If you think of wind or vata, it's light. Right. Is it what you identified? One of the most important properties of vata. Is it stagnant or mobile? Mm -hmm. Right. Mobile. Right. Is it dry or moist? Like when you're right. when you have wind burn on your face, it's kind of dry and rough. Right. Right. So that's vata. So when you think of the properties of vata and how it manifests in our bodies using light, using mobile, right? Using, um, it's usually, uh, you know, cold, uh, dry, rough, right? That's how it manifests in our bodies. So people mm -hmm. who come into this world with more vata in their bodies, they tend to have drier skin, right? They tend to have drier hair. Yeah. They tend to have, and that's the beauty of Ayurveda. It's very preventative. Mm -hmm. um, in that it can almost predict if you don't manage the 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 original balance of doshas that you're brought into this world um you can it can lead to serious issues down the road right so right. too much vata in the body right too much dryness in the body can lead to issues down the road right so it's almost like someone who has more who has more vata in their body has to take more measures to mm -hmm. check the vata than someone who comes into this world with pitta and has less vata in their body, right? Mm -hmm. But what I do think is super important to focus on because Ayurveda is, the beauty with Ayurveda is it is focused on the mind, right? So now let's talk about how vata would manifest in the mind. Um, and I feel like you're kind of getting this. So oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to throw this back at you, like that mobile sure. nature of Vata that we were talking about. How do you think mm -hmm. that would manifest in the mind? Like, would someone have slow thoughts, fast thoughts? Yeah, I mean, with, with Vata, I mean, it just seems like the uh, stereotypical American, you know, who's always on the go and, you know, someone in New York City where they're constantly checking their phone, they're constantly, their their mind is really not in the present and it just seems like they're, 
either thinking about, you know, they're conjuring up some doomsday scenario or they're thinking about, you know, did I leave my stove on or, you know, it, and, and it's interesting because I think I mentioned to you that it seems like there's a parallel between like the doshas and the, are you familiar with like the Myers-Briggs uh, type indicator, the MBTI? So this is what we have. This is what we are. How do we, how do we balance? And you mentioned the preventative thing, like how do we balance that? So like if somebody, as you mentioned, who's Vata, who's very on the go versus someone who is Kapha, who's more sort of grounded and a little bit more stagnant, like, can you talk to me a little bit more about sort of how to uh, achieve the balance so that, you know, we don't get too much of one element uh, at the expense of the other? Right, right. And so that's why Ayurveda is such a beautiful thing, right? They give us mm -hmm. these us, these properties that identify the doshas, right? Yeah. So they tell us Vata is light, Vata mm -hmm. is cold, Vata is mobile, Vata is dry, right? Vata... Um, is kind of cloudy, right? Mm -hmm. so these are the properties they identify with Vata, right? A person, and let's say like me, I came into this world with a lot of Vata, right? And now mm -hmm. I'm living in the New York City, which as you identified, has yeah. similar properties to Vata, very fast moving. It's, yeah, it's a sure. city that never sleeps, right. right? So now it's a Vata person who already has the propensity to for mobility, for dryness, for lightness, mm -hmm. for roughness, right? They're put in a Vata environment. In a Vata world, yeah. Right, which is enhancing or antagonizing the mobile nature, right? The quick yeah. pace nature of Vata, right? So to balance that, it's doing the Kapha type of activities, right? Because if you're talking, if you're saying Vata's mobile and Vata's light and Vata's cold, right? Then the quickest way to balance Vata is through warmth, through, mm. through moisture, mm -hmm. through heaviness, through groundedness, right? Yeah. Just like I came, just like I said earlier that it's the concept of my, macro and micro and everything in this world is composed of Vata, Pitta, Kapha, right? Right. So if you compare even food, right? So if you take a vegetable like lettuce. These doshas are not just, you know, isolated to human beings this is basically everything in the universe so like a uh like a forest like a tree has elements of doshas or you were just about to talk about this the food you're eating has doshas so it's not so it's a little bit like myers-briggs on steroids i guess you could say because it applies to every atom every element in the universe that's a great way of summing it up yes yeah, yeah. absolutely so go on you were, you were saying okay. about food i think okay so if you compare lettuce and a potato, they clearly have very different properties. Mm -hmm. And one clearly has properties in my mind, because I know Ayurveda, right? One sure. clearly has Vatha properties and one clearly has Kapha properties, right? Mm -hmm. Kapha, if you remember, was kind of mud. It's that it's that earth and water. Stagnant, right? so it's heavy, stagnant, yeah. heavy, right? Cold, sure. low, right? So a potato, if you think of a potato, right, does that have more Vata properties or Kapha properties? Probably right? Kapha, for sure, yeah. And what's clear is it grows in it grows in soil. Mm -hmm. It is so mm -hmm. Kapha, right? It's coming yeah. from the ground, right? When we talk about being grounded, like it's it's not a coincidence that the potato is coming from the ground, right? So right. in this scenario, someone whose Vata is a little bit out of control, they really should be utilizing foods that have properties like potato, right? Mm -hmm, that are mm -hmm. around them because they're opposite from the properties of Vata, right? And it works yeah. the other way. Someone who um, is, Kapha is too aggravated. You start to notice not only their bo body, but their mind starts to become more lethargic. They start mm. to have less motivation. They're kind of, they don't have the energy to do things. They kind of just want to really? sit on the couch. Right. Mm -hmm. So instead of potatoes, <laughs> right? Exactly. Are you going to feed a couch potato a potato, or are you going right. to feed an energizing salad? Right. right. But that's truly why. Um, when I was in my twenties and I was dealing with, you know, my relationship not working out, and I already had this uncertainty, these vata type emotions, and I was sure. also a vegan at the time who was eating beans and salad. That's kind of why it wasn't the best diet for me. Mm -hmm. Because even Threw your if you, doshas out of balance, it sounds like. 
a little bit excess of vata, yeah. Right? So lettuce, salads are more of a vata type. They're cooling, right? And even beans, even though you, you generally eat beans cooked, um, beans can be very drying, right? Mm -hmm. And there is an element of, there's a major element of vata and beans because, you know, the stereotype is that beans give you gas. That's all the air, right? right? right. So it's almost like I needed to change my diet to more of a kapha grounding diet, which is heavy, moisturizing, and warm, mm -hmm. right? Nourishing, right? And eating that way over some time, it has to be over time. It's not going to be one meal that's going to decrease your vata, but over sure. time, you start to notice that your mind has more of a grounded nature and is not so airy. Uh, so you mentioned about the relationship aspect that sort of pushed you in the direction of Ayurveda. Could you talk a little bit more, um, and as much as you feel comfortable sharing, um, but about the health complications that uh, that sort of spurred you to embrace Ayurveda, Ayurveda a little bit more um, wholeheartedly? Absolutely. Um, so the health complications that I was referring to, they were all in the mind. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And maybe it manifested physically with me losing some weight from being really sure. stressed out, but it was really the mind. And to me, sometimes mind complications can be so much harder to deal with than the physical, right? Mm -hmm. Because the physical, we can sometimes say, oh, I have someone who can help me with the physical or the physical I maybe have less control over or it's an acute injury, but the mind, right. it becomes a little bit harder because your yeah. mind is what's processing what you need to process. And if the mind is in balance, then what you're processing is in a very imbalanced way, right? Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. almost like the mind is the lens where you see the world, but you also want to make sure your lens is balanced. So what do you do when your mind yeah. is imbalanced, right? And you're trying to make, make, you know, tails or heads of what's going on with the situation in front of you. Right. Right. So I wanted to escape my mind. I didn't like my thoughts. Mm. I slept a lot. Right. And I would try to keep myself as busy as possible because the concept of just sitting with my mind was very uncomfortable for me. I didn't sure. like the thoughts I was having. Right. Mm. And, you know, I was always anxious. Like I was an insomniac at the time. I wasn't sleeping well. Um, I don't know what, how many people have dealt with anxiety. It's a hard feeling to explain because you know, when I tell people I'm anxious, they're like, what are you anxious over? And I'm like, no, you don't get it. It's yeah, not a, exactly. Right. It's not one situation. It's not, I can't even identify what I'm anxious over. It's this feeling. Sure. Right. This feeling. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of what I was, you know, that's kind of um, where my mind was at. And initially I was trying to distract it as much as possible, but I soon with realized, activities and occupying yourself. Right. And it's really delaying the inevitable. Sure. We all need to sit down with our minds at some point in our journeys, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I started to realize quickly that I was kind of, this was a delay tactic. And so as much as I um, was delaying, it was just going to prolong my healing journey, right? So I kind of decided to tackle it head on, which is why I started to research food as a way of making me feel more balanced and really going back to the pranayama the breathing techniques and the meditation. Um, mm, okay. I wasn't okay with my mind and my thoughts. And I yeah. almost sometimes wished I was a different person, which is weird. Like I wish wow. I had a different, I wish I had a different mind. Yeah. Right. Uh, as, as you and I have talked about, I mean, that's very similar to, to my journey, which is, you know, I grew up as a first generation immigrant. And as you, as we talked about, I don't know if it was on camera or whatever, but about the four different career paths that you have, probably two at the time, but, you know, it's basically either be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. And, you know, I felt a lot of pressure as a first generation immigrant, a lot of high ideals to live up to, a lot of comparison. And I got, yeah, I got to the point where it was, it was literally eating away at my soul. It was literally eating away at my mind. Um, and I didn't even think about something like Ayurveda at the time. Um, and so, you know, I had actually, you know, and I still do, I mean, I see a therapist, I take different medication, um, but I'm just curious, like, it, it, had you tried any of the conventional methodologies or did you sort of just go straight to uh, Ayurveda to, to try to help with uh, some of these mental, uh, mental uh, challenges that you were facing or mental issues? Yeah. 
So from a very early age, I kind of did the reverse of what people did, right? So where most people would turn to allopathy and then turn to an alternative once they realized yeah. allopathy had its shortcomings, I would do the mm -hmm. opposite. I always okay. tried to go to the alternative and then only if it didn't work, would I go to allopathy, right? Gotcha. So thank, thankfully, why you gonna, right? Thankfully, the stuff that I did really worked, right? Okay. And I can't yeah. stress, I really can't stress this. I mean, I haven't stressed it at all, but I want to stress it now. Like everyone should be doing pranayam, everyone. Mm -hmm. So pranayam um, is considered, it's, it's intentional or yogic breathing, right? right? And so, you know, if you look at Patanjali, he had an old eightfold path of yoga. So usually when we think of yoga in the West, we think of yoga as being asana or posture based, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yoga um, in the East has a very different perspective. There's eight limbs of yoga. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one is pranayama, mm -hmm. and which is yogic breathing. And yeah. Ayurveda recognize, and yoga, they recognize this connection with your breath and your mind. Right. So they, they recognized if you can slow down your breath, you can slow down the thoughts in your mind. Yeah. So in that eightfold path, all the meditation techniques, like the concentration, the meditation, they come after pranayama. So mm -hmm. it's like asana, pranayam, so yoga, postures, pranayam, meditation. And the thought is that the asana prepares your body for meditation. The pranayama mm -hmm. prepares your mind, right? So a lot of my clients would come to me and they would say, okay, I got off, off of work at five. I hopped on the subway, went home to my apartment. And before I did anything, I sat down to meditate, mm -hmm. right? And I couldn't do it. They're so mad, at, so disappointed in themselves that they couldn't sit down and meditate. And yeah. I look at my clients and I say, I've been met doing a breathing practice and meditating for 10 years. And I wouldn't be able to do that either. Yeah. Like come home and sit down and start meditating. Right. And what happens is it never worked for me. And I'm not saying it can't work for some people. But what I started to realize is your mind needs to be in a sort of relaxed place, even to in order to meditate. And sure. so pranayam, the breath work, even if it's 10 minutes, right, by consciously manipulating your breathing, and that could be by increasing your inhales, holding your breath, or manipulating the rate at which you exhale, right, you can almost clear some of these things, clear your mind out so you're in a better place to then sit down and meditate and get into mm -hmm. that space, right? Yeah. And the reason why I think everyone should be doing pranayama, honestly, this is just my personal experience, the days that I don't do pranayama, I experience the world very differently. And I imagine, yeah. I imagine that's how I experienced the world in my twenties before my Guru Ji gave me the practice. Right. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's like, it's a change on such a subtle level. It's like hard to explain, but it's like super powerful and it doesn't have yeah. to be a long practice. I do an hour practice every morning because I love it, but really, mm -hmm. 10 to 15 minutes of intentional breathing because we do not breathe on a day-to-day -day, like long enough at all right. it's actually very short um it starts to do things in your structure in your kind of in your body in your cellular yeah. structure and it starts you start to feel like a different person yeah i right? absolutely agree yeah yeah i mean there were times for me like health wise like i would go through the day and I would just, you know, especially because I used to be in consulting and, you know, that involved a lot of travel, working in financial services. So, you know, dealing with difficult clients, dealing with difficult coworkers, you know, there were literally times in the day where, you know, I thought I was having like an asthma attack or something. Like mm -hmm. it was literally so bad where, you know, and I, I one time had to just go to the hospital because I thought I was, and they did the blood work, they did the test. My lung function was completely fine. And, you know, at that point, I realized that it's it's not something if you're just trying to look at the surface, it's it's you're not you're not it, it's not only ineffective, you're causing yourself more damage because if you're taking a steroid, if you're taking an inhaler, if you're taking some kind of medication to combat, you know, what's presenting on the on the surface of things, then you're actually sending, you know, your body, other elements of your body into uh, out of out of whack right 
And so that's why it's so, yeah, like you're, you're, you're spot on. I mean, I think the pranayam is really like, you know, when you're focusing on the breath, it's kind of like, I always equate it to like being a conductor in an orchestra, you know, you're sending the signals to the rest of your body to work in alignment, right. Yeah. Versus just trying to think about that next uh, TPS report or <laughs> that, yeah. uh, you know, that, that next deliverable that you have to get out the door. So yeah. it's, yeah, you're absolutely. It's so important. So, important. and you know, Ayurveda really recognized this as connection because prana from an Ayurvedic perspective has two meanings. Mm -hmm. So it's our physical breath, pranayam, right? Prana is breath and mm -hmm. yama is control of breath. Um, but it's also what the Chinese people refer to as chi, right? Mm -hmm. Life force or life energy. Right. And this prana or this chi, it governs our satisfaction in life our immunity in life, our contentment in life, right? And so the more prana your body has, right? Mm -hmm. The better the better you're able to kind of deal with the world, right? And then also just to, you know, there is a lot more research done, not so much on the mind, but there is a lot of research done between pranayam and the physical benefits of reducing yeah. cholesterol, right? Cholesterol, yep. like my mom's now off her cholesterol medication after doing pranayam for a significant period of time, right? That's so great. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, my uh, to to jump in there, my wife was taking uh, she was taking a blood pressure medication, and I'm not kidding. It literally like she virtually almost lost her eyesight. Literally, like she couldn't she couldn't see. It was one of those side effects. And you read through that uh, you know that that never ending war and peace length of you know symptoms and contraindications and warnings on the drug labels there's never it doesn't cover every little thing um and it was amazing because she got off that and then she started doing meditation she started taking some uh i think it was ashwagandha um arjuna some of these herbal herbal medications or remedies and she was able to decrease her blood pressure you know uh so it's just amazing. it's incredible you know yeah yeah and I mean, I don't want anyone to get the impression that like I'm anti-medicine, I'm anti allergy right. right? That's not the point, right? The point is, I think everything, Ayurveda and allopathy has a place and a time, mm -hmm. right? Like I would never, and it's not because I don't believe it. So this right. has nothing to do with my personal belief. But if a client came to me with cancer, I would never yeah. tell them, ah, stop doing chemo. I'll feed you. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Right, like seriously, right. I would never do that. And to be quite honest, there are people who have healed themselves through fasting or through a particular diet, right? But that's that's not my place to say whether that's what's what worked, right? So yeah. I would never take that position. But at the same time, I would say, yeah, you should absolutely do chemo if that's what your Western doctor is telling you. But the way Ayurveda could support your healing journey is help you with how you maintain your immunity or maintain your strength because the chemo is not only killing the cancer cells it's killing your prana your ochas right the stuff yeah. that we need mm -hmm. in life that gives us our life energy so how do we use foods and herbs and pranayam to support that right or right. to kind of lessen the effects of the chemo on your body Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think of this whole, you know, with Ayurveda, with herbs, with, you know, with um, yoga, I think of it more, you know, we talked to, I think I, you and I have talked about this. We talked to the chief medical officer at uh, Chopra Global. And I think it's important when you talk about, you know, terminology, a lot of times this whole paradigm was referred to as alternative medicine, but I like to look at it more as integrative medicine, because if, if you like you lose a limb or something um you know or, or if you cut yourself or you know if, if you sustain some severe physical injury you definitely need those tools and the technologies that western medicine provides um but in order to sustain the improvements in order to amplify it and to avoid throwing things out of balance uh with one you know with taking one particular intervention you know uh Ayurveda and yoga and, and all these other things we're talking about can be, you know, extremely beneficial. So I think it's, you know, they definitely complement each other. Um, and I, I'd like to understand a little bit more. Um, so we talked a little bit about, I always say like with Western medicine, if it, if it's taken to the extreme, it's, um, it can be thought of as like a, like a pill for an ill approach, you know, where it's like, oh, you know, you have high blood pressure, take this medication, or you have, you know, kidney issues, take this. Um, 
versus Ayurveda, which is more holistic. Um, and it, it looks at multiple disorders, just, you know, the whole body putting it into balance. Um, but that said, I mean, do you think in your experience, are there any specific disorders or conditions or challenges that you found that Ayurveda has been uh, very beneficial for? Absolutely. Um, and just before I get into the specifics, I do want to mention one thing. Sure. I do think there's a difference between leaning on Ayurveda when you're sick, like with yeah. a physical manifestation, right? Because mm -hmm. according to Ayurveda, there's actually six stages of disease and where allopathic medicine would get involved at the fifth or sixth stage, Ayurveda mm -hmm. is trying to teach people to recognize imbalances before they get to the fourth and fifth stage. Right. Mm -hmm. So for instance, Vata, if you, if you don't check Vata, right. And you allow it to accumulate in your body, there's a numerous number of Vata disorders that can lead to one of them. There's a lot of disorders to the nervous system. So one of them could be Parkinson's, right. Mm -hmm. Bring that out as an example, if you leave it unchecked, right. So the power in Ayurveda is to notice in the first or second stage that your Vata is getting agitated right? Mm -hmm. like looking mm -hmm. at your mind and looking at your body and then incorporating food and herbs mm -hmm. in those two stages to kind of bring it back, right? So I just think it's important to mention that because there's a difference uh, between when you would go to a doctor in the West, like usually there's yeah. a manifestation, right? Sure. It's like, I feel like I'm dealing with depression and you need to diagnose me, right? But why are we waiting to that point? Right. right. Why are we waiting to that point? Because there's a lot of imbalances in our body that like you can't go to a doctor to treat, but you don't feel good. You don't feel content. You don't feel happy. Right. Sure. And so I almost feel like that's the power in our UV. It's the subtle, it's building an awareness in the person, right. To recognize these subtle differences in their body and mind, figure out which, mm -hmm. agenda, right. And then address them. So that being said, hands down, anxiety, insomnia, right, is very, um, Ayurveda could be very beneficial for that, sure. right, in a couple of ways. So one, food, herbs like ashwagandha, right, but then the pranayam, right, mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. super important from that perspective, right. So from a vata perspective, it's, it's the anxiety, right, it's the um, insomnia, right, it's the constipation, mm -hmm. because that's how it sometimes will manifest um, in your body. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you're irregular, right? A vata energy is very irregular. So sometimes right. you're eliminating a lot, sometimes you're not, right? So that types of stuff, Ayurveda's very good at addressing. Um, mm -hmm. In addition, anything digestion related, I feel like Ayurveda's yeah. amazing at, at, mm -hmm. at helping, right? So there's a lot of clients that come to me that are very constipated. Like yeah. apparently, according to some Western doctors, we're only supposed to go to the bathroom once every two or three days. So it's not called constipation unless it exceeds a certain amount of days, right? Is is um, that a West? That's a Western uh, standard. Oh, a Western guideline. Or? I have a. I don't know if it's a standard guideline, but I just know a few clients have told me that when they addressed, and a lot of them come to me for IBS because mm. IBS is kind of this undefined thing where if they can't sure. figure out what else is wrong with you, they just like toss you in an IBS category. So right. they've come to me and they said, I said, well, are you regular with your elimination? And they're like once, you know, once every two or three days, but that's fine. My doctor said that's fine. Right. And from an Ayurvedic perspective, wow. we don't expect everyone to eliminate um, the same amount of times, right? Because there's people yeah. that have more Vata, more Pitta, more Katha. Mm -hmm. so at mm -hmm. the very least you're eliminating once a day. So a kapha person who has kind of a slower, heavier digestion, they likely will eliminate one once a day. Bitha, mm -hmm. fire, right? So it has a lot of metabolic transformative energy. Mm -hmm. Someone who has high bitha, they have no issues going to the bathroom. They go three or four times a day, right? Yeah. And yeah. then a vata person is very irregular. So digestion, okay. just because I feel like um, um, Ayurveda has a different perspective on digestion, I do think eating Ayurvedically can really impact the way your body's digesting food, right? Mm -hmm. So um, is digestive issues, are, is that 
a large segment of the uh, clients that you work with or what are some of the other disorders that uh, so it sounds like anxiety digestion what are some other ones that you can so that in you've new seen york a lot of? i have a lot of people that come to me for insomniac sure. they're they're having trouble sleeping right and then i also have a lot of people that come to me for diabetes mm, um, okay cholesterol and blood pressure but that's more from so one it is an ayurvedic there is an ayurvedic component a food component to it right but they're also coming to me for pranayam because pranayam is mm. very effective at lowering you know blood pressure and even with diabetes yeah. diabetes i don't know if there's studies right but with diabetes it's known to be helpful to that as well um mm -hmm. so and then what else do people migraines right and the beautiful thing about Ayurveda is everything's connected to a dosha, right? So right. you can have anxiety, right? But the anxiety, it's not really telling you anything by calling it anxiety. You then have to go a step further and say, well, it's the anxiety of Vata anxiety, a Kapha anxiety, or a Pitta anxiety, right? Mm. A Vata anxiety would manifest as someone who is scattered brainy, having a hard time sleeping, can't yeah can't focus on doing a task because they're overwhelmed with thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. Pitta anxiety may represent him or herself or themselves as angry and critical and impatient, right? And with others. And a kapha kind of anxiety may manifest as being paralyzed or unmotivated, unable to take on the tasks of the world because they're super overwhelmed, right? Mm -hmm. so it's, it's more like paralysis, it sounds like, yeah. Right. So it's important to also notice how these pro properties, these goodness that we we're talking about, how they manifest in whatever condition you're dealing with, body mm -hmm. or mind, right? Is it how are how are how are uh, your clients coming to you? I'm always fascinated to understand because in traditional medicine, you know, people they go on their portal and they you know find a doctor, or they look on health grades, they see the you know qualifications and stuff, but with Ayurveda, Ayurveda, it's so fascinating. Um, like, do you have, is it sort of word of mouth or um, have you had situations where there are allopathic uh, practitioners or physicians referring uh, people to you? Yeah. So of the past like eight years that I've kind of been having my practice in New York, I would think there's mm -hmm. maybe two allopathic doctors that ever sent me over clients. And interesting yeah. enough, it wasn't for the food component. It was for the pranayama component. Mm -hmm. So one doctor was running a, um, she was dealing with, she's a surgeon and worked with breast cancer patients mm -hmm. out of Queens, mm -hmm. and they have a very big Asian population, both Chinese and Indian. And there right. was a Chinese clients that kept coming to her, right? So during chemo, they kept saying, but what should I eat? Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The doctor wasn't even focused on that. What do you mean? What should you eat? Right? right. But it was. Right. Chinese clients really coming to her and saying, no, what kind of diet should I be eating? Right. And mm -hmm. that prompted her then to reach out to me and said she had a grant where she can provide supplemental support services to these mm. patients. So what can okay. I offer? And we came up with like a Branayam program for her clients. Great. Right. Okay. So but honestly, she's a very open doctor. Like that's very open minded. Right. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, for whatever reason, anytime you mention something against the mainstream, which I'm not even viewing it as against, it's what you mentioned, right. complimentary, Integrative. Yeah, right? Exactly. There's this resistance, like that's some like voodoo science or whatnot. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Um, but I mean, come on, you take, you take pranayam and you take yoga and you call it mindfulness. And now all of a sudden in the West, it's being practiced in schools, right? Yeah. No, one's, no one's taking any qualms with that, right? But yeah. somehow the fact that breath, and so this is what's super interesting. I find this fascinating. Mm -hmm. We all know we need breath. Like I yeah. think, what is it? You can survive maybe two days without food or three days. You can survive a little bit more without water, but you can't even yeah. survive like what, two minutes without breath, right? right. So we need breath so everyone yeah. recognizes on some level whether they choose to admit it or not that breath is essential to life right mm -hmm. but when you when we go through our daily motions we're literally breathing so quickly that we breathe about 15 times and when i'm talking about a breath i'm talking about an inhale and exhale we're basically mm -hmm. doing that 15 15 times a minute yeah and which is not <laughs> 
Well, it's be, yeah. I mean, it's 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 you're not providing your body with any oxygen. You're not oxygenating your blood or anything like that. Yeah. Right. Right. Given that there's there's only so much oxygen. What is it like? Eighteen percent in the air. Right. And then you're breathing mm -hmm. it in. It needs to go through all these body parts. So the oxygen's getting trapped in your body. Right. So the amount of oxygen actually reaching our tissues and organs. Right. Is very minimal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, we're all about berries and antioxidants. Right. But why don't we <laughs> yeah. try to increase our inhale? Right. Yeah. Or more instead of increasing the inhale, why don't we increase the exhale and sort of um, maximize the amount of toxins we're releasing from our body? Right. Yeah. And just and I think you would appreciate this point because it's kind of scientific, but um, the inhale is very connected to the sympathetic nervous system mm -hmm. and the exhale is very connected to the parasympathetic. Right. Yeah. So the more we exhale, right, the more relaxed we can become. Well, you know, it's interesting because with with the breath, I totally agree about how it's such a simple but un underutilized tool. And I feel like it sort of the way I look at it is that breathing sort of helps evolution take its course. And when I say that, I mean that when we don't breathe and let's say, you know, there's a deadline coming up or there's some curveball that's thrown at us automatically our fight or flight response gets kicked in and that reptilian brain gets activated. And so we're basically, you know, regressing to this caveman mentality that, you know, we, you know, it's basically everything's on the line and we're functioning at a very low level, right? And the cortisol is just going through our body and we're just not, we're not on top of our game. Absolutely. Whereas if you, if you breathe, then you're activating that uh, the prefrontal cortex or you're you're activating that more developed portion of your brain and so you know now you're basically coming into the 21st century right but i know i know yeah. it's not daily like i'm a i think you might have mentioned or maybe not but i'll mention it i'm a corporate attorney like you know mm -hmm. for the most part so i write a lot of contracts and it's amazing like now my pranayam if i do my practice in the morning that's that's pretty extensive. I can bang out a contract in like half the time than if I do, mm. because it it gives you so much clarity and focus, right? Yeah. So if anyone's just appreciating pranayama from a pro productivity perspective, right? Because we are a capitalist society, and we're, yeah. you know, the society promotes us as being doers. So people oftentimes feel guilty. Why would I sit down for an hour and breathe in the morning? When yeah, what's the, R, what's the ROI on that, right? Right. <laughs> Too that you do workshops and retreats. Can you maybe tell me a little bit more about that? Like, are you working with corporations or are you working with nonprofit groups? Maybe I, I want to get a feel for these retreats that, uh, or not retreats, but the workshops that you okay. mentioned uh, on your website. Sure. Um, so the workshops have arisen in different contexts. Some mm -hmm. um, nonprofits have reached out to me just because through our network, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe one found me online, but most people hear uh, what I do or they've attended a workshop and then they um, mention it to their organization, right? So during COVID, um, there's a lot of organizations that kind of stepped up their game and mm -hmm. They're offering more to the public, but their staff is also being spread thin. Um, mm -hmm. So a few organizations have kind of focused on wellness with their employees and their staff. And so they've brought me in, in addition to other other pract pra practitioners, um, just to give their staff coping mechanisms, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of workshops, I do a lot of Ranayam <laughs> workshops with organizations, right? And then with the Ayurvedic cooking, you know, um, I worked a lot with an Indian restaurant in Manhattan. Um, mm, okay. She, okay. And, That's the name of the restaurant, Pondicherry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She actually, uh, Anita J. Sagani, she's, she had her first restaurant in Houston, which is Pondicherry. And then she opened one in New York. And, and okay. she is amazing because she embraced like i went into a restaurant one day and i love the setup right so they, mm -hmm. they basically do indian food but they they make they do it fusion style so she'll mm -hmm. have a green dosa which is a dosa with sprouts and like some other stuff right pumpkin okay. seeds, 
right? I'm kind of a purist, so that sort of flies in my face. But yeah. yeah, no, I hear you. And when I eat, when I cook for myself at home, I probably wouldn't do that, right? But it's yeah. a fun experience when we're going out. Sure. Right? Yeah. So I'm really into the way she cooks, and I'm really, and mm -hmm. I was really at the time into her space. She's actually okay. closed her New York City location right before COVID. Um, so her and I vibe really well. I just walked into a restaurant one day and I was like, let's breathe together, right? Let's mm -hmm. chat, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. me and her, we've, you know, we've vibed for, I think it's been like four or five years since I've known her. Um, mm -hmm. So we still do a lot of like workshops in New York City and then out of her Houston, um, okay. right? So that's kind of the collaboration that I like, like, you know, working with other kind of Southeast Asians. Right. Mm -hmm. And I also think it's important for me to offer it to my community um, yeah. and not just my community, but like other black and brown communities, um, because I feel like oftentimes we're dealing with some other struggles. Um, yeah. Right. Where this is really helpful, too. Right. So that's kind of the workshop part. But what's really exciting to me are the retreats, really, that we do because. Yeah. yeah. Right. You so said because um, I don't know if we talked about it yet, but uh, the practice that you guys—it's you and your sister, right? And she's she's based in Costa Rica. Um, so yeah, could you tell us a little bit more about tell, tell a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'd, I'd be lo love to hear that. And she's formally trained in yoga, and mm -hmm. I'm formally trained in Ayurveda. And the connection between yoga and Ayurveda is they're really viewed as sister sciences. Yep. They complement each other. Right. So a lot of Ayurveda protocols involve yoga, right? Mm -hmm. Like asanas and other aspects, breathing, right? So, and it's all Vedic based. So the philosophy, mm -hmm. like the macro, micro, like the doshas, it's all kind of arising exactly. out of the, the Vedas. Yeah. Right. Um, and so what we started to realize is it could be extremely overwhelming for someone to come in and mm -hmm. learn different components from us. So come learn and I'll show you how to cook Ayurveda for yourself. Come learn and breathe. Come come learn and do asana, right? And it could be super overwhelming because now they need to go home and practice this journey on their own, right? Yeah. So my sister and I were like, why don't we create an immersion program that gives people a jump off, right? Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. we can instill certain practices for a week and we can nourish their bodies and minds and show them how to do the pranayam, how to do the asanas, how to do the cooking. And then when mm -hmm. they come home, they're in a better place to truly embrace this into their lifestyle. Yeah. So it's more holistic. It's more of a way of life rather than these standalone uh, disjointed activities. So and I really do believe that's the biggest change that I noticed with me practicing Ayurveda. Now I experience everything in the world as vata, pitta, kapha. Mm. Right. Like even so movies. you're looking through that lens, it sounds like uh, the Ayurvedic lens. Yeah. Even the movies I watch, the music I listen to, right? Vata, Pitta, mm -hmm. Kapha, right? And there's other yeah. cat categorizations, like there's also a mental categorization, which is Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas, right? Mm -hmm. The Gunas, right? That's the, the Gunas, yeah. Yeah. And that even to me is more, can be more enlightening than the Doshas, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. when you start to look at, you know, like Sattva is bringing purity and clear clarity, Rajas is kind of bringing this exciting, kind of stimulated energy, and and yeah. Thomas is more like that kapha heavy energy, the flat, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Even like the movies we expose ourselves to, are they Safa, yeah. Rajas, Thomas, right? And if they're more Rajas or Thomas, that's completely fine. If you don't already deal with issues of Rajas and Thomas in your mind. The thing that I found extremely unique about what you guys do is is the cooking aspect, you know, and and it's you know it's something that talk, gets talked about a lot about you know how food is life um, in in Ayurveda, but I haven't really seen many um, practices really incorporate that. So, um, can you talk a little bit more about the cooking, especially one thing that I found really interesting, and I um, wanted to learn more. You said that your uh, cooking involves vibrational ingredients, so maybe if you can talk a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Um, so cooking to me is the process of not just cooking, right? So it's going to get the ingredients, going to the store mm -hmm. and getting the ingredients, right? It's right. bringing them into your home, preparing the space before you cook, 
right? Mm -hmm. Cleaning the space before you cook. So treating it like a ritual and it's sacredness. And it should be that, right? right? Because it's nourishing Mm -hmm. our bodies, right? Right. So a lot. So when I go to the store, I belong to the local co-op. So really, when I talk about high vibrational ingredients, all that means is ingredients that are enriched in prana, life energy, right? Mm -hmm. And the prana, you can generally tell by looking at at like greens, right? If something's mm-hmm. wilted, you can tell it's a little bit older and doesn't have as much prana, right? Mm-hmm. The most prana a veg a vegetable is going to have is when you first harvest it, right? Everything's intact, so that's mm-hmm. why eating food that you grow is specifically good for your body if you're if you're looking for more prana, right? So. Even the fact, and you know, I understand that there's contradictions with the studies of organic, mm-hmm. and I get mm-hmm. it. I get the flaws in labeling something organic. They still let right. in a bunch of bad things, right? But honestly, like just your sensory or your your taste buds alone tell you when you taste an organic tomato, like comes mm-hmm. up in certain things versus a non-organic tomato, you can tell one has more prana, mm-hmm. right? Okay. It's the color, it's the taste of it, right? So I'm very into picking local, seasonal, only fresh vegetables, right? And I understand there's also studies that say, look, frozen broccoli sometimes has a higher nutrient component than broccoli you buy on the shelf because mm. they harvest it and freeze it right away. Right. Mm, And I get that from a Western perspective, but from an Ayurvedic perspective, you're now taking that frozen broccoli and you're putting it in a freezer and you're depriving it of air and you're depriving it of light. So to me, from a pranic perspective, frozen vegetables don't have much life energy. Right. Okay. Okay. So when we talk about high vibrational ingredients, it's choosing ingredients that have the most amount of prana in, in it. Right. So that's it being fresh, organic, non GMO local in season right Mm -hmm. so one is setting out your ingredients the next step for us is preparing the vegetables right Mm -hmm. and even that is done in sort of a ritual way like we like to from my sister and mine perspective and we learned this Mm -hmm. i don't want to take credit from this it's maya tawari who's an ayurvedic practitioner who Mm -hmm. i love her ayurved because this is what she focuses on Maya Tiwari is very big in um, chopping vegetables according to their lifelines. Mm, so like, okay. her it, right? Because her perspective, and I agree with this because I sense it sometimes, is every mm-hmm. vegetable has a cellular intelligence, right? And this mm, intelligence okay. can be disrupted if you're not keeping it intact when you chop vegetables, right? So from a carrot's perspective, because to me, a carrot is long this way, I never Mm -hmm. chop a carrot like this. It's always trying to preserve the natural lifelines. So you're saying the the way you chop up the ingredients can actually impact sort of like the the benefits you get from it then or something like that? Preserve the prana in it and preserve. Mm. And now the prana is preserved and the intelligence is preserved. So it knows what it has to do in your body. Right. And that is the hokiest thing I will say on today's podcast, because I get it. It's not a perspective that you would hear from Vasant Ladd or some of these other um, Ayurved practitioners that are very technical with it. Right. But Maya Tiwari, she's also the one that has an amazing healing story. She basically had cancer and they told her she was going to die. And she went up to Vermont to her friend's cabin to go die. But instead, she fasted and cured herself. She came back to New York City, they scanned her body and there was no cancer, right? So it's like, that's someone who I'm going to, I'm really gonna appreciate their intuition and their wisdom. Yeah, as they say, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't argue with, uh, you know, that kind of, those kind of results. I mean, that's (laughs) that's pretty compelling. Yeah, and even stirring, right? Like think Mm -hmm. about it, If if you're making a pot of soup and you're stirring like this. Yeah. Right? That's bad yeah. energy. Right? That's okay. putting in all this like commotion, right? Versus stirring in one direction calmly. Yeah. I mean, I'm no chef myself, but I know that like certain foods like um gosh, I'm like I'm I'm drawing a blank here, but there's certain is it 
also buco or there's some foods that like where they marinate for hours and you can taste like the consistency of the meat it's just very it's a very different experience versus you know something you just uh threw in uh through through in the oven or through yeah. a mic nuked for like you know a couple minutes yeah. so oh that that's that's incredible so that's so i guess in in essence that's what this um vibrational concept is it's just looking at the source of the ingredients looking at sort of how the the meal is prepared and like the, the ingredients are the space so that's why i always clean the space beforehand right treating it uh -huh. like a ritual and the energetics you know how many people i've canceled dinner invites to i'm not cooking for you if i'm in a bad mood i'm not doing mm. that like you're mm -hmm. my friend and i love you and i will not put that my energy in your system so mm. it's also the energetics of this chef which is why you know people have asked me a lot of times are you going to start a ayurvedic food delivery program right? yeah i was one of them my, my, my wife was like we need to, we need to get some ayurvedic meals <laughs> right and if you guys can figure out how it works because i can't right because I'm, yeah. I'm kind of like but we're but we're moving away from nourishing our loved ones and i get it yeah. you can't cook for your loved ones every day i get that right but my worst nightmare would be if someone came to me and then became reliant on me to feed them because right. that's not what this is about it's about mm -hmm. empowering you to do that right because you ultimately know yourself better than i know you and you're gonna know mm -hmm. what your body needs whether you're vata imbalance pitta imbalance kapha imbalance right so mm -hmm. i never want to um make people relying on me because that's the beauty in ayurveda it's self-empowering yeah so you're more em your emphasis is more on like teaching people how to cook versus like actually preparing do you still do the meal prep services like where you prepare meals and deliver them or or you kind of I do in a very them? narrow context there's two mm -hmm. clients that I'm currently working with that have digestive issues so as part of the treatment I am cooking for them but the mm -hmm. expectation is that as soon as this kind of six six week program is done I'm no longer yeah. cooking for them okay yeah. okay you know it's it's not really any headline obviously that covid has been a big, big disruptor in pretty much every sphere of our life um maybe just you know in a, in a broad sense like how has covid impacted your own personal journey with ayurveda as a practitioner but also um as a as a provider to, to clients yep so just keep in mind because i was in new york city prior to covid a lot of people did come to me for anxiety sort of issues but i did mm -hmm. notice with COVID, it's been a lot more, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I, I have been asked to do more Ayurvedic consultations and more breath work. Of course, with COVID, the breath work is more virtually now or through Zoom, yeah. right? So it's a different type of experience. But I mean, I feel like COVID did have a really big impact on me. Um, and I don't want to downplay COVID especially right. for anyone out there who lost someone from COVID. That is terrible and my heart goes out to you, right? So right. This, please don't take this in the wrong way. But I do think COVID has offered me a better perspective on life, right? Like mm -hmm. even my relationships with my parents, I feel this strong desire to be closer to them, right? So yeah. I think on one level, COVID returned us back to what's truly important. Mm -hmm. and why does it have to be that we have to go through something very negative to get that kind of reality check right, right. Um, and it also made me very well aware of reinforcing this concept of maya that everything's an illusion illusion yeah mm -hmm. our lives can change so quickly in a matter of weeks or months right right no one would have thought prior to COVID happening that new york city would have ever been shut down and so I think what ended up happening is more people needed to pause or had more opportunity to pause. Things are mm -hmm. closed, they had more time for themselves. So that's when you take these pauses that you start to notice that not everything is balanced within you, right? Mm -hmm. So I always feel like whether it's COVID or the fact that people were taking more pauses, I definitely noticed more people reaching out to me. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And then you said mostly like for people finding you, it's been mostly sort of word of mouth or um, like what's, and then I guess maybe follow-ups from some of these uh, workshops that you've done, that kind of thing. Has that been mostly sort of how you've brought in uh, more, more clients? Yeah, as much as I love social media, right? 
I also recognize for my dosha type, for my mm -hmm. like my like how I am, it's not very healthy for me. Yeah, right? yeah. So I'm really not, you may notice I have, you know, Facebook page, I have an Instagram page, but I'm not one of those people that is constantly posting, right? right. And what I've noticed with my legal practice and my Ayurveda practice is the people who need me, who need to find me, not because it's me, my my practice, right? They need some sort of wisdom, whatever they need from me, right? Again, mm -hmm. not because of me, um, they find me. Yeah. And I don't know, like it's it's random, like oh, it's not because of that. It's not because of that. It's not because of that viral TikTok video or anything like that. It's just the universe no. sort of sending them your direction, right? Right. It's like if you eat, like if people know you do something and not many people do it, you're the go-to person, right? Mm -hmm. So if anyone mentions Ayurveda and I have a big network in New York and one of the people in my network is there, they're throwing my name out there, right? Because right. they've either done a workshop or, you know, um, so... And it's the same with legal, right? I haven't advertised much, but I'm very blessed in what comes back to me. So, I mean, I'm, and I, um, again, I don't want to come across sounding privileged because I recognize yeah. there's privilege in saying this, but I try not to think in fear and scarcity. I try to think of abundance. Abundance. Abundance, right? right? So I always welcome the opportunity to collaborate with anyone, even if they're doing the same exact thing as me, mm -hmm. because to me, there's abundance for us all, right? Mm -hmm. And I also feel very indebted to my Guruji that found me and the practices that people have given me that I really feel the need to share this with people who truly need the healing. Not because they're doing it for a fad, like go work with anyone for that, right? Like I, yeah. I don't have the time for that, right? But if you're truly want to adopt this as a way of life, like you're truly willing to embrace this, it'd be mm -hmm. my honor, like my humble honor to share my practices with you because People shared those practices with me, you know, yeah. Just pay it forward. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I mean, I could talk for hours about this, but obviously, you know, I think there's only 24 hours in a day. Um, but I, you know, I'd love, is there anything else you wanted to talk about, like in terms of your practice, um, in terms of anyone who's looking to get involved a little bit, you know, deep in their journey in Ayurveda, like what are some parting words of wisdom? Um, that you'd like to share? Um. So I would say really embrace those moments of pause in your life and just be like truly just be because I think in this world and the society we created, it's all about doing. And, mm -hmm. you know, Indian India is very such a big dichotomy. If you think about it, it's so mm -hmm. extreme because at the same time, we have some of the most spiritually, religiously elevated people in the world. We have the South right. East, in the Himalayas, right? But then mm -hmm. also as parents put tremendous pressure on our children to hit certain milestones in life, mm -hmm. right? Find ourselves Definitely. by our by our worth, right? But when you go to India and you talk to people, right? Indians don't have that perspective. They're willing to support these sadhus journeys because they recognize that they're doing an important part. They're elevating the vibration for the rest of us. Right. Wow. And that's their sacrifice. So they're we willing to do that. Right. So I just think it's important to just be and not do. Um, because I think there's contentment that can come from being comfortable in your own self. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah, nowhere that can come from that. So I did want to highlight uh there is a way if people want to get a hold of you, what's is this? I just put this on the screen. Is it enlightenliving.com? Is that uh is that yep. the best way to get hold of you? It is. Okay. And you're interested, you know, obviously in talking to people about Ayurveda and any other types of collaborations you're interested in exploring if people are, you know, people hear this and it resonates with them, which I'm sure it will. So it's the food and the breath that I really connect with and I'm most passionate about. And I understand it's not all about me, but mm -hmm. at the same time, that's what I'm most comfortable working with, with people. Food and breath. Okay. Yeah. I'm okay. not yoga. I'm not asana certified. So I could recommend poses, but I'm not comfortable adjusting people's yoga practice. Right, right. Okay, very good. Uh, well, thanks again, Neil. And this was uh, this was a real treat, and I always love you know. Talk, I could, like I said, I could talk about this for for days. It's it's a blessing. It's a gift, and it's something that you know. Hopefully, through these types of discussions, people will find you know 
things to add to their toolkit for better managing their mental, physical, and spiritual health. So I want to say thanks again. Thank you, Nico. So.